really glad that all of you are here today because we really have uh, some important work to do to talk about this um, really what can be a difficult subject, but uh, it's a very important subject. And I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning thinking, okay, what was I going to say? You know, and so I rolled around in my head. And, and I have to tell you that this has been a subject that's near and dear to my heart since I was uh, a teenager. I um, went to a, uh, let's see, underage party, shall we say, it, uh, at Metacomet, which is right around the corner up here. And uh, there were some things going on at this party that, you know, were not okay. And I was 16 years old, and I had no idea who to talk to or, or what to do about any of this kind of information. So I think it's really important that as adults, we have the information to be able to share with our students. And on a personal note, all of us in some way have been affected by um, intimate partner violence or by sexual violence in our lives. And so it's important to do that. You know that we have the Human Services Program here, and we are the only uh, school that has the Family Violence Intervention option. We have a class called Family Violence Intervention, which I started at the Yukon School of Social Work and brought it here to Tunxis when I came here in um, 1998. So 16 years we've been teaching that class. And I'm, I'm bringing that up to you because after the students take that class, they say every single student should have to take that class because of the information that we talk about. And when we talk about intimate partner violence, we talk about elder violence, um, we talk about uh, violence against children. So all of those kinds of things. So it's really important that uh, we really listen to our students and then know what to do when they talk to us about these kinds of issues. So um, with that, we'll introduce the day. And uh, Jessica and I are, are delighted that all of you have joined us. Thank you. And um, you're going to start the video. The first video. The yeah. first video. The first of three videos. It, this one's really short. I had it. Um, Mike Zitch was awesome. He put it together. And Patrice was, is the voiceover in this one. And this is um, a short clip that I have employees, students, and law enforcement. It doesn't take a hero. He did not deserve it. Be aware. Be alert. Be safe. What it does take is someone who is willing to do the right thing at the right time. No means no. It's not your fault. Not on my campus. I can dress how I want. I will stand up and speak out about sexual assault. Take a stand with Tungsis Community College against sexual misconduct and intimate partner violence. try to get it up on the monitors so they won't have the sound necessarily but students will get the awareness that we are taking a stand against this. Hi again. Okay so I'm uh, here to introduce Elise Dela Cruz. Yep. Yes uh, and so she uh, prior to joining CONSACS worked uh, for nearly two years as a counselor advocate for the LGBTQI uh, uh, survivors of sexual violence at the Women Family Center for Sexual Assault Crisis. And throughout her employment opportunities, she's had a variety of positions uh, working with LGBTQI, uh, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, and allies. We'll do A for ally, right? Um, she's worked with uh, survivors of sexual violence, police violence, uh, and of course LGBT uh, violence. And she is a facilitator today, and we are so delighted to have her here. So please welcome her. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Getting to close those other mics. Make sure everybody can see. And so, can I just shut off the yeah. mic so that we're still fine? All set. Great. Um, and so, 
Thank you so much, Colleen, for the introduction. Uh, like she said, my name is Elise Del Cruz. I'm the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator at CONSEC, Connecticut Sexual Assault Crisis Services. But I will say we are changing our name. If you are at our annual meeting, we are going to become Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. And I'll talk a little bit about just our, um, sort of who we are and also our name change. And so before I get started, we're going to be talking about sexual violence, right? Um, and this is a hard topic. I recognize that we have survivors in the room. There are survivors in every room. And so if you need to take a break, step out, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, please um, feel free to do that. Also, so I love Prezi. This is a new template I found. Um, I ran, tested it out once. It didn't make anybody dizzy. But if it does, let me know. <laughs> um, I think the first transition is the only one that gets a little. There we go. All right, that was our big spin. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so Consex, we're the statewide coalition um, for uh, sexual assault crisis programs in the state of Connecticut. And so there is nowhere in the state of Connecticut you can go where there isn't a sexual assault crisis program that covers your area. As many of you already know, the program that covers your area is the YWCA of New Britain. Um, what's really important is that all of our centers provide these core, these same core services. One, um, they, we operate a statewide toll-free hotline that's in English and in Spanish. We're one of a handful, literally less than five states in the entire country that has a, um, a Spanish language um, hotline, which is shocking. Even big states with high Spanish-speaking populations, much higher than us, like California and Texas, don't have it. Um, and so that's really important for us because we, we understand that people need support 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and we, have, we, we provide that. We also have certified sexual assault crisis counselors. And so what's really important about being certified sexual assault crisis counselors is that our counselors have privileged communication. By going through the training, by being supervised by um, staff at member centers, it, um, they're able to hold the information that they're get given um, truly in confidence. So even if subpoenaed, the only information we could ever divulge is this is the person I saw, and these are the services that we provide in general. And so that's really important for folks to know, is that when they're calling us, we can hold that information confidential. Uh, we also provide medical, police, and court accompaniment um, and advocacy. And so I was talking with Jessica earlier. She's one of the fabulous ones here at the um, YWCA of New Britain. And so one of the most common uh, things that we do is we do um, hospital accompaniment. Particularly in the Hartford area, we have a lot of hospital accompaniment. And so if you watch Law & Order SVU, which I both love and hate, right? Uh, so I love because it really has brought a lot of attention to sexual violence. I hate it because it also promotes a lot of misinformation. I also wish that all of the processes went as smoothly, relatively smoothly as they do on Law & Order. You know, you go to the hospital on Monday, file a police report, there's arrest by Friday, two weeks later there's a trial and conviction. That would be lovely if that happened. That almost never happens. But, so what's really important is that most folks are never really interacting with a lot of these systems. And it is very intimidating thinking about going to the hospital for the first, going to the hospital and saying, I've just been sexually assaulted, what are my options? And so our advocates are there really just to be like an extra support person. Our advocates are trained, they know the system, they know what's coming, they know, and can give you a little heads up. And that's really important to have. All of our centers also offer support groups. And so that looks a lot different depending on the center. So pretty much all of our centers offer sort of the traditional NAAA style support group. But we also have um, centers that are doing yoga, art therapy, and it really depends. Our Milford Center just got a therapy dog, which everybody's very excited about. Um, the puppy is still in training, so can't actually work yet. But just even having that dog, we really, they've really been seeing a lot of a large positive impact. We also offer bilingual and Spanish and male advocates available at all of our centers. We know, particularly for male survivors, about 50% of the time they only want to work with other men. And so we would like to have that option available for them as well. Um, we have all of our advocates, we have advocates available in Spanish at pretty much every center. But let's say in the Danbury Center, they have a large Portuguese speaking population. They also have a bilingual advocate in Portuguese as well. We provide information and referral and um, community education. And so I think initially when Consex was started, we thought that we were just going to be like handing out like numbers. That's not how it works. And we'll talk about um, later throughout the day is that when 
folks experience sexual violence, it's not like this, the sexual assault is confined to one area of their life. It really impacts several different aspects of their life, and they need support around that as well. And so our advocates know the, their surrounding area and also know what their resources are. So if they need help with housing, um, they need long-term counselors, all those things that they may also need, they can help them um, navigate that as well. Really just being a support throughout the entire process. Um, at Context, we also have the Co uh, Connecticut College Consortium to End Sexual Violence. Um, thank you, our, we, one of our first meetings of this year was hosted here at Tungsis, actually in this room. And it was an amazing space, and, we were, and so this is a really time for folks from colleges and universities to come together and learn more about sexual violence, and also network as well. And so these are some of the things that we provide at, at Context. Part of the reason, um, and so this is our map. <laughs> Part of the reason that, there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, so when we're talking about um, sexual violence, so part of the reason why that we're changing our name, right, is that one, we want to incorporate, one, context doesn't actually provide direct services. That is what we fund member centers to do. And so that's part of the reason for the name change. But also, we wanted to incorporate sexual violence as a phrase. Oftentimes, when you're talking about sexual assault, sexual violence, people automatically go and they think about rape, right? And so rape is definitely the most recognizable form of sexual violence, but we also recognize that sexual violence takes place, takes, um, looks like a lot of different things. It's really a continuum of behaviors. Um, this isn't shown to up too well, but like one, the couple of highlights thing is this definition is from Jane Doe Inc., the Massachusetts Coalition. And one, sexual violence is a multi-layered oppression. And so it's really important to think about the multiple layers. Skip along. And this is actually, I love taking things from other coalitions because we like to share, they have great things. And this is a chart from the Washington Coalition. And so what I really love about this is that in one, it centers oppression as sort of the beginning of the base of all of sexual violence. And so at context is that we like to think that you cannot talk about sexual violence without talking about oppression, right? Sexual violence is often used as a tool of, of oppression. And so it's really important to think about what are these systems of oppression that are really feeding sexual violence. We recognize that you see it like sort of one at the lower end, the one end of it. Does it have a, at the one end, of, it does have a laser pointer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, so one end we have sort of like misogynistic practices all the way down to like rape and murder. Could you explain what misogynistic and so misogynistic practices are, if you think about a lot of the things that really sort of communicate like a hate, uh, distrust of women, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about rape culture later, right? And so we think about things that really, uh, one of a really obvious uh, common sort of misogynistic practice is really undermining like women's intelligence, right? And not allowing them to sort of have their own autonomy over themselves. And so thinking about how we see that sort of misogynistic practice particularly come into play when we're talking about sexual violence. So once someone, a woman says, I've been sexually assaulted, and one of the first things a lot of people will say is like, are you sure that really happened? I'm not really sure about that, right? That's a part of a misogynistic practice. So while this isn't a physical uh, sexual assault, it is a part of sexual violence, right? When you think about like sexualized depictions of women and children, right? That's also a part of sexual violence. I watch a lot of TV and I will use a lot of pop culture references because that's what I do in my free time. And so I used to love the show Boy Meets World when I was younger, right? And so now they have like a spinoff Girl Meets World. And I was watching it one day and at one point the five-year-old son in the show like bends down and he has this little play girlfriend and she goes, oh, look at that tush. And um, the little boy says, oh, I don't mind. And I was watching that, this is like on the Disney Channel. And I was shocked, I was like, why do we think that it's okay that it's really embedded in children's programming to sort of objectify and sexualize children, right? And so that is all a part of sexual violence. And so all of these things also contribute to rape and also the environment that allows rape to sort of flourish. It's also important when we're thinking about the spectrum of sexual violence. Um, we have some, some acts that are sort of on the lower recognized and the higher recognized spectrum. And so things from sexist and homophobic comments, sexualized depictions of women and children, street harassment, sexual harassment, statutory rape, sexual assault, child abuse, and always down to rape. And so if we were to ask people to identify sort of what sexual violence, 
most of the time, people are going to identify things with more on um, that end of the spectrum. That also sort of coincides with law enforcement intervention. And so what's important is that, particularly when we're talking about intervening and preventing sexual violence, is that we all have the ability to step in and intervene throughout the entire spectrum and not wait for law enforcement, like where it gets to a point where law enforcement intervention is needed. And so it's important to recognize all the different things that fall in, under sexual violence and so we can begin to notice it and intervene and really sort of change the culture that we live in. Any questions? You can interrupt me with questions at any time. Um, all right, there we go, we're moving. Okay. And so there is one study that's done it that said it takes an average of two hours of watching primetime television to see or hear a depiction of sexual violence, right? And so that is your law and order, that is your evening news, that is your scandal, right? All of that, it, it takes an average two hours of watching it so for you to see or hear a depiction of sexual violence. And so if we were to think about all the different information that we're getting about sexual violence just from what we would take in from TV, we would begin to see a pattern of myths, and uh, of myths around sexual violence, right? So I'm going to ask for your help in this, so start identifying some of these. And so if I was to ask you, thinking about when we're watching TV and we're seeing a depiction of a victim of sexual violence, right, what are, the, what are some of the characteristics that you typically see you victims portrayed as? Here we go. So what is typically their gender? Female. Female, right? Almost always. We rarely, if ever, see any um, men as survivors. We almost never see any trans folks, gender non-conforming folks, uh, as victims of sexual violence, right? What about their body size? They're skinny. Small, petite, right? What about their race or ethnicity? Yeah. Oh, most often we're seeing white, right? What about their age? Young, 18 to 24 ish range, right? And how do you know that they've been assaulted? Bruising. Bruising, absolutely, right? Bruising, crying, really upset, right? And so this is Jennifer Love Hewitt from uh, Law and Order um, SPU episode, and this is Katie Strickland from Private Practice. Right? And so these two instances were different in that these were one of the, it's changed a little bit now, particularly if you're watching like more cable TV like American Horror Story or things like that. But these were two uh, instances were different in that they actually showed the sexual assault. Usually you'll hear it and then sort of like the door will close or different things, but they actually showed the sexual assault. And you see with both of them, they're both visibly like bruised, battered, right? And that's a misnomer. The majority of times in sexual violence, that you're not seeing these same sort of physical injuries along with the sexual violence. Um, and so oftentimes when people are thinking about like whether or not a victim is telling the truth, they're looking for these cues that we're seeing on Law and Order at SVU, right? And so we're thinking about images of offenders, right? And so if I was to like, if I was to have you describe an adult rapist. So I want to copy, uh, copy an adult rapist, someone that's sexually assaulting adults, right? So again, what is typically their gender? Male, Male right? What is usually their race or ethnicity? Black. Right, a man of color, black, uh, particularly African American or Latino. What about his body, body size? Big guy, right? Where does he usually attack? Alleys, dark alleyways, right? He also may have a baseball cap or things like that. Hoodie. Maybe it looks like this guy, right? And so this is a, these are real pictures I'm pulling up from like, you know, this is a sketch from a guy I believe he's sexually assaulting people in like um, New York, right? And so offenders do look like this sometimes, but this is not the majority of time, right? And if I was to ask you to sort of describe or think about an image of a child molester, right? And so are you thinking of someone that's a male? Yes. Balding? <laughs> white? Right? 50s. Does he drive a white van? Right? And so maybe he looks like this guy a little bit, right? And so I do this everywhere, right? I do this presentation. I've done hundreds of presentations. I do this everywhere. Everyone has the same images of perpetrators and of victims, right? What do you think the impact of this is on victims? If they trust someone, they really shouldn't. Yes, trust someone that they shouldn't. What else? Absolutely. Right. 
absolutely. That's a big one, particularly with children. We have, research has shown that children are less likely to identify what is happening to them as sexual violence if their perpetrator isn't a stranger and sort of looks like this. They identify as something they don't like, something they want to stop happening, but they don't necessarily identify as sexual violence. I think about how often when I was younger, I really sort of like boomed all over the news. Everybody was talking about watching out. And that was also like when the internet was first coming, they're like watching out for all these people that are coming to get you. Watch out for the stranger danger, stranger danger. Who is most likely to sexually assault adults and children? Family members. Family members. Family friends. Family friends, right? Someone you know. I watched, again, I use a lot of pop culture reference. I spent a lot of time watching TV. So I was watching the talks the other day. And they were talking about this parent who let their children walk home from the park. And Sharon and Osborne was like, that's where all the perverts are going to be. That's where they're going to be, and that's where they're going to get the kids. That's where it's shown. I'm like, that's not true at all. But most often, these are fo who folks are looking toward. And the reality is that you're most likely to be sexually assaulted by someone you know and trust, right? And that's the scary part, right? Is that, unfortunately, perpetrators don't walk around with big signs saying, look at me, I want to be a perpetrator. That would be so much easier to avoid them, lock them up, right? But it doesn't work like that. You already answered that question. And so we also need to think about how is the impact of these myths, right? And also on when do we hold offenders accountable? And so Dr. David Lisak is amazing. We've run into Connecticut a couple of times, and he does a lot of research on perpetrators of sexual violence. And so he also interviewed, uh, he surveyed juries. And he said, when are you almost 100% likely to convict someone of sexual, of sexual assault? They said, when there are use of weapons, blitz attacks, physical and sexual violence, and there are strangers or in isolated areas, right? He said, almost 100% likely to convict. And so think about a lot of that sort of fits the, sort of the, um, the, um, the story of the East Coast Rebus. So does anybody remember seeing these billboards up and down like 91, 95, a couple of years ago? And so the East Coast Rapists first came to sort of popular as our attention after a woman in West Hartford was sexually assaulted in much the way that we, that we sort of the, we think that sexual assault happened, was jogging early in the morning. Someone literally jumped out and sexually assaulted her, right? That person actually was an East Coast Rapist. We did end up catching that person fortunately, but right? But everybody was like, this must be the East Coast Rapist. So we got like a large task force, multiple states. And so the East Coast Rapist was someone who was sexually assaulting folks up and down the East Coast for about 15 years, right? He ended up being a truck driver from New Haven. His last two known victims were two young girls in New Haven. And I lived in New Haven up until last year. I didn't hear anything about that, right? And so when we're thinking about, again, in the, in the case of the West Hartford case, the victim sort of fit a lot of the characteristics that we think that uh, victims of sexual violence and the attack fit a lot of the ways that we think. When they were like particularly low-income women, young women of color, we don't necessarily, folks don't necessarily pay as much attention. And so it's important to think about, and I'm going to continue to talk about different identity categories, right? We need to think about how perception, bias, and um, all race and ethnicity and gender and sexuality and ability all come into sort of um, our perceptions about sexual violence, right? And so again, then he asked, David Lee Sykes asked folks, when are you almost 100% likely not to convict someone of sexual um, assault? They said when it was a nice guy, he drank too much, there was a miscommunication, it was unpremeditated, um, they don't believe it will happen again or it will ruin his life, right? They said that's almost 100% likely not to convict in those instances. Whenever I think about this, what always sort of shocks me is that in a lot of these, it's not the assumption that he didn't actually do it, but the assumption is that it was a mistake, they're ultimately a good person, right? And so this is Jeffrey Marsalis. He was known as the Match.com rapist. And so he would create all these different profiles on Match.com. And he was a, everybody says he was like a very like charismatic guy. And like he said, he was like a surgeon. I had like a picture of like him as a surgeon, like had the hospital bed. He was an astronaut, like all these different things that he would like sort of create these identities. And so he would go out on dates with these women, um, go to meet them out like for, at a bar, get drinks. He would drug them and take them back to their place usually and sexually assault them. 
He lived in the Philadelphia area and mainly perpetrated in the Philadelphia area. Um, when, he, when they finally arrested him, 22 women had come forward and said that he sexually assaulted him. I think only about five or six went to trial and it was broken up in about four or five trials. And so out of those four or five trials, out of those 22 women, how many convictions do you think he got? None. None. It wasn't until he was awaiting one of his other trials, he went to, um, I believe it was like Iowa, and sexually assaulted one of his coworkers <laughs> that he was finally convicted. And so the difference that really, what made a difference in that case is that one, she was a lesbian, right? And so she could be like, listen, I'm not even interested in men. Because the way that he would normally do it is that he was dating them, right? And he'd be like, oh, you know, after he was sexually assaulted, I had a great time. See you later, right? And so a lot of them didn't even necessarily, weren't even aware of what happened automatically. Two, she immediately went to the hospital and had an evidence collection kit done. But the most, um, the piece that really put him away is that they had a witness. The cab driver saw him basically dragging her in her apartment unconscious. And that was allowed him to be convicted. But it wasn't until we got all of those evidence that he was finally convicted. Uh, what really sort of degraded the other cases is that some of these women continued to see him afterwards. There was always alcohol involved, right? And so our perception is that alcohol makes consent a little fuzzy. Is that people aren't as sure about consent once the alcohol is um, involved. And there's been, particularly as of late with a lot of the attention on college campuses, like there's been a lot of research done, alcohol doesn't actually make the consent fuzzy. Like perpetrators of sexual violence always know when they're violating consent. They may justify why they are violating it, but like the alcohol doesn't really make their um, ability to perceive whether or not they got consent fuzzy at all. And so then we need to think about prevention, right? And so we have, we'll talk about sexual violence, and so what are we gonna do to prevent it? And so first, one of the more classic sort of forms is rape whistles, right? And so this picture I got from a blog from a woman who um, went to Brigham Young University in Utah. And she goes, the first week of campus, the Women's Center handed out um, rape whistles to all the female students. And so what's the idea about the rape whistle? Is that if I'm being sexually assaulted, I blow the whistle, and then what happens? The person stops, someone runs for help. So how many of you, if you were walking down the street, you heard a whistle? You're like, let me stop, someone might be assaulted, and I need to go intervene, right? This is our idea of what rape prevention was. And this was like everywhere. Like so many people were really like, yes, rape whistles. Again, if you watch a lot of TV, you will see like even rape whistles come up in TV a lot. That's an idea of prevention. Not really, right? And so then we have rad classes. Huh? Absolutely, like these rat classes are actually still like going on and they're really popular. So what we do know is that self-defense classes are really great at improving self-esteem, but they do not prevent sexual violence. What we do know is that one, the most, the, most often the people who are taking these rat classes are survivors and they're most of, oftentimes triggered very much by these classes. But again, rat classes are really important. Because we like to think, particularly with these ideas of prevention, that we're doing something to prevent sexual violence. Now we're getting into newer forms, right? So now that there are all these new products. And this was from last year. Well, now it's actually almost two years, about a year and a half ago. Is that on um, Indiegogo, you know, everybody's crowdsourcing everything. Um, some, some guy came up with anti-rape underwear. And so this is basically a chastity belt, right? And so it has like, like hard like metal or I think metal or plastic bands up at the top and at the bottom. So the idea is that you can't cut it, you can't rip it. If you see sort of like on the center, like that's a little lock basically, that unless like a woman like undoes does it, then you can't pull her pants down, right? And so everybody was just like, yes. Yeah, no, it was, there are a million of these, but everybody was so excited about this anti-rape underwear. You see, their goal was $50,000. They raised almost $55,000. They're like, yes, this is what we need. We need this anti-rape underwear. And so what are assumptions are they making about like rape, particularly with this anti-rape underwear? It's all about penetration. Absolutely. It's all, it's all about sort of vaginal or anal penetration. So that's where, you know, 
Um, there's also sort of the assumption, like when they sort of, if you watch the video, they were like, no, you're going out, you put on your anti-rape underwear, it's cute, you fit under your clothes. And so the idea is that also that you're going to be sexually assaulted when you're out. Um, and so this was not from not too long ago, was uh, the anti-rape nail polish. And so the idea is that you paint your nails in this pretty pink nail polish. When you go out, you swirl and you get a drink, you swirl your fingers into the drink. And if there's been like a GHB or any other like date rape drug or any drug, then it will change color. Again, these people got on the Today Show. I think it was like four like Harvard students, or, uh, I believe. Like they were everywhere. Everyone was like, "Yes, this is what we need." There is also um, a lip plumping like lip gloss company that sells similar like um, drug testing kits that with the like lip gloss. And these anti-rape like beauty products are really popular, particularly nowadays. What assumptions are they making? Absolutely. So alcohol is going to be involved in the sexual assault. So women. All women, right? And it's all women with a certain gender presentation, right? I don't wear makeup. I don't wear nail polish. And so I guess I'm out of luck with this, right? Mm -hmm. And then similarly, if, even if we go back to the um, <laughs> anti-rape <laughs> underwear, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we go back to the anti-rape underwear, right? These are pretty much the sizes that it comes in. I would not be able to buy any anti-rape underwear, right? And so we make a lot of assumptions about who is going to be sexually assaulted. And a lot of it is on our sort of traditional notions of beauty. Because we oftentimes link what we perceive as sort of like commercially attractive with sexual violence. You hear this all the time, well, who would want to rape so-and-so? Or you hear when there's always like a really high profile like athlete, star, or somebody that accused, they don't need to rape anyone. They can have sex with as many people as they want, right? We oftentimes link this idea of uh, attractiveness with sexual violence. But what is also the other assumption with all these quote unquote prevention techniques? It's all on the women. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so ultimately, it's the victim's responsibility to do something to prevent their sexual assault. We don't actually hold the offender accountable in any of these scenarios. Well, they're never going to do anything to prevent it, so. So the idea is that, you know, if we do all these things, ultimately it's up to your, you to sort of prevent sexual violence, your own sexual assault. And this also often quickly turns to victim blaming, right? So if you hadn't, you took the classes, why weren't you able to fight back? If, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? These are, this is what most often is said to survivors immediately after assault. I remember I was on an accompaniment with a young girl. Her mom came in to the hospital and she goes, you see what happened? Because she was out like drinking with her friends when she had, you see what happens when you want to be out there drinking? Right? Like ultimately we consistently um, put the like blame of the sexual assault on the victim because they didn't do anything to prevent their sexual assault. And so what we're really are trying to do is we also part of what we're doing in context is we want to shift the conversation. We want to shift it from talking about what the victim needs to do or not do. Because ultimately you can do everything right, right? You can do everything quote unquote right. You can like take the classes, wear the you know nail polish, do whatever, all these things, and you can still be sexually assaulted. And so what we really need to shift is how do we change our culture? How do we prevent more uh, uh, offenders from becoming offenders, right? What can we do to sort of shift this conversation? Um, if I was to ask you how many young girls before they reach th their 17th birthday will be sexually assaulted, what would you say? I would say, well, you can't. Four. One in four. <laughs> Actually, luckily, don't look at somewhere where we feel a little outdated. I hear one in four. Did I hear one in three? One in three girls before their 17th birthday will be sexually assaulted. What about boys? One in six. By 18. One in six. There's also a great organization called One in Six. If you want to learn more about male survivors, don't leave because <laughs> well, if I was to ask you, and so this you won't get more information, this is new information. What if I was to ask you about adult women? One in two. Two out of three. Right? What about adult men?
one and four. And so, if you look at sort of, and so I also, and so with many of these statistics, I always assume that the rates are higher, right? And so if I was to ask you about the transgender community, what's the rate of sexual violence in the transgender community? One and two, right? And so with all these statistics, I always say they're likely higher. Because again, I know folks who are very outspoken about being survivors, and if somebody calls them, which some of these surveys that we gather, some of the information does, literally calls people at home, have you ever been the victim of sexual violence? A lot of people are like, absolutely not. If they tell everybody else, they won't tell them. So likely they're all higher. That's my skin. So what sort of do women having experienced sexual assault as mm -hmm. well? Um, but it seems as though whenever there's a rape case, like women seem to be less empathetic of the two genders a lot of the time, like yeah. what drives their politics. Yeah. I think, honestly, it's, it's our, it's, I just talk a lot about like internalized oppression, right? Mm -hmm. Rape culture, like we take that in. And so oftentimes, what I really try to break is there's no like sort of us, them, like men versus women, right? Everybody takes in the same rape culture and regurgitate it out. Like I've seen it, like I've been in, I had like large presentations and some of my, I've had equally vocal men and women like being like, absolutely not, like this is ridiculous. Women lie all the time because this is what we're fed. And I also think a lot of it is also about um, making our own, making ourselves feel better, right? And so if like, if Susie down the street did something to cause her sexual assault, then that was her problem. That's something that she did, that's something that she could do something differently to prevent it next time. So therefore, like I'm safe. But if sexual violence really just happens, right? And we really just have a culture that encourages sort of like, um, sort of the hostility, the lack of consent as, and normalizes it, then like what do I do with that again? Again, if thinking about, similarly when we're talking like uh, perpetrators of sexual violence, if there really is the monster boogeyman guy that's gonna jump out of the bushes or the guy in the van that I need to be aware of, that's a lot easier than thinking about my best friend my uncle, my mom, right, as possibly perpetrators of sexual violence. And so I think, honestly, a lot of it is what we say to ourselves to make ourselves feel better um, around it. And so, like, so it's important to recognize that sexual violence happens all the time. And so what I want, particularly want to draw your attention to, the rates of sexual violence for children before they reach 17, right? So before they step foot on this campus, you already have, like, lots and lots of survivors. And so oftentimes, as much as sexual violence happens, a lot of people like to ignore it. Act like it doesn't really happen as often. But it really happens a lot, and we just don't talk a lot about it. So if I was to ask you, how many men self-identify as rapists? Right? What would your guess be? One in 20, five percent. And so David Lee Sack, this is sort of like one of his beginning like uh, research things, is that he has about, this is about like a 300 question survey. He started when he was in grad school getting his PhD. And it's, uh, his study has been reproduced time and time again. And on, on average, about 5% of men self-identify as rapists. And so what he particularly looked at, men who had never been arrested for sexual violence. I almost find that an incredible figure, that's 5%. Yeah. Isn't that large? It's not, it isn't, is it? One in 20 men that's yeah. self-rapist? Yeah, and so they, they don't ask them like, hey, are you a rapist? But they say like, have you ever like forced through like forced or coercion, forced someone into sexual contact, right? And they're like, yeah. And so I asked David Lee Sack the last time he came, I was like, okay, he sends out the survey and then he calls them in for interviews. And I was like, okay, I can see people writing this down on a survey, but nobody's gonna actually come in and talk about it. He said about 95% of the people that he called in said like, okay, I'll, I'll come in. And so when I look at this, I actually think that like, it's actually lower, right? Like it's low, I was like, that's great. And so the vast majority of men will never perpetrate sexual violence. But what we do know is that those who perpetrate sexual violence are most often serial offenders. In his study, um, he did particularly one in Boston about, out of like 1,800 uh, men. And on average, their age is over 28, I believe it was. And on average, they had committed six sexual assaults already. And so when we also know perpetrators of sexual violence, they don't just wake up one day and say, I'm gonna stop, right? There has to be some type of intervention to like stop them. Um, and so this number, like I'm glad it's not higher, right? But it is frightening. Think about like folks like will just willingly like just admit to that. Well, we also know about perpetrators of sexual violence. 
they most often have cognitive distortions, right? And so that is, what are they telling themselves to make what they're doing okay? David Lee Factor actually has a video um, that sometimes I show, where this, um, this is a Frank video, and this college student at like a very prominent uh, fraternity, I think at like Duke University, and he talks about one of his sexual assaults. And this guy, like the way he talks about like the woman he sexually assaulted, he one it both makes her like very innocent and naive for not knowing better. But then he was like, well, she are, well, you know, she had done it a thousand times before. And so it's like, what are you telling yourself to make what you're doing okay in your mind? And even we have advocates that work on sex offender um, supervision units, um, and they sit in the sex offender treatment groups. And part of what their job is to not only represent the voices of victims, but also get the, the offenders to um, take hold accountability for what they did. And that's like a large um, like hurdle for them to get over, saying like, yes, I did this, and this was wrong. And that's one of the first things that they need to work on. They work on with um, perpetrators of sexual violence. So sexual violence happens a lot, right? Um, and again, like I wish it was like the sort of boogeyman monster, but that's just not how it works. It's also important to know that sexual violence, um, depending, like, if you're from an oppressed community, you're more likely to experience sexual violence. And so throughout this uh, presentation, I'll talk a little bit more, particularly about like the LGBTQ community, right? And so here are some general statistics about sexual violence in the LGBT community. One, 68%, uh, about 58.7% of homeless youth have been sexually victimized, homeless um, LGBT youth have been sexually victimized compared to about 33% um, of their heterosexual counterparts. We see 73% um, of LGBT college students um, reported experiencing sexual harassment compared to about 60% uh, of their heterosexual counterparts. Um, trans and gender non-conforming folks, the, we're just starting to do more and more research and get more and more data. There have only been sort of like two big national studies done as, um, to date about um, discrimination and violence experienced by the trans community, but we know that their rates of sexual violence are really high, particularly for trans women, trans women of color. Um, trans and gender nonconforming folks experience higher rates of violence and discrimination in general than other trans folks. And we're talking about um, one study says 50, 51% uh, of trans and Alaskan Native um, and Native American youth who expressed trans, trans and gender nonconforming identity were sexually assaulted while they were in K-12, right? And so what we do know is that when you combine a lot of these um, identities together, we see an increase in rates of sexual violence. 32% um, of black trans folks reported being sexually assaulted while in prison compared to 13% of the overall trans community, right? And so sexual violence happens. And when you combine a lot of these like different identities, you really see like higher and higher rates. We also know sexual violence is one of the is the least reported crime, right? We're talking about in general, we are seeing statistics anywhere from about ten, only about ten to like twenty to thirty percent of sexual assaults will ever be reported to the police. But oftentimes that is sort of our sort of uh, judge on who's been sexually assaulted. Well, why didn't you call the police? I love the singer Jill Scott, like love, love, love her music. But after Bill Cosby came out, she goes, Well, why didn't they go to the police sooner, right? And so if saying things like that, it's not really recognizing sort of all the different barriers that a lot of survivors face to even report, right? And so we're talking a little bit about here we go, sexual violence at Tonkins, right? And so there was one study that did on two and four year colleges, and it said 35 in every 1,000 students will be sexually, they're sexually assaulted a year, right? So 35 in every 1,000. Wikipedia told me that you have 7,000 students, so that equals, on average, about 245 victims, right? And so I do this everywhere, and we get the similar numbers, like really high. Are you all seeing 245 folks coming forward each year? No, a lot of people don't report. And you know, and again, like I pulled up your, your Clary reports, and then similarly, like you know, for the past couple of years, reported zero, which isn't uncommon. I've seen huge, I mean, like 70,000 like membered, uh, like population like campuses report no sexual assault in a year. Like 70,000 students, and you're saying no one, right? And so this isn't really uncommon, particularly for a two-year institution, not to have any sort of reports. But the importance of this is highlighting that there are a lot more folks who are experiencing sexual violence that aren't reporting it. And so the goal always is to get more reports, right? And a lot of schools, particularly we see in like a lot of like the bigger four-year institutions are like terrified. They do not want their clearing numbers to go up. 
Um, but it's actually a good sign. Like, if I had children and like they're going away to college, like that's what I would want to see. Like schools with higher numbers, because that means that there are more folks. There are, uh, more folks are feeling comfortable um, reporting. And in these next couple years, particularly with the new legislation, I actually expect to see these rates, these numbers, to go up. So. All right, and so when we're thinking about the incidence of sexual violence on campus, right? And so according to the Department of Justice, one in five college women will be, um, will be sexually assaulted on college campus during their academic careers. One in five, right? And so this is a really common number. And again, uh, nine out of 10 will know their perpetrator, um, will know who their perpetrator. And so oftentimes when we're often thinking about like community colleges, um, versus like four-year institutions, we think about like, oh, well, you know, it's really, a lot of the data is focused a lot on four years. But what one study did show is that only about a third of sexual assaults at four institutions actually occur on campus. About two-thirds of it take place off campus. And so thinking about like, just because you all don't have dorms doesn't mean that sexual violence isn't happening. A lot of it still takes place off campus because it's again about who do you know? Who are the people that you're around? When people, you know, when you come to campus, like this is your own community. It becomes things like small bubble, you see the same people, right? Those are the folks who are most likely to sexually assault you. Um, again, less than 5% of completed and attempted rapes were uh, reported to uh, college women were reported to law enforcement. Um, but two thirds of the uh, women did tell another person. And so this is a really important piece. Is that a lot of times folks are not going to report, but they are going to tell people, whether that is a friend, um, a trusted professor, um, a, like uh, an advisor, someone that they feel safe and comfortable to, they're going to report, like disclose to. And so it may not be like, hey, I was sexually assaulted yesterday. It could be like, you know, something happened and I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Or you notice something up, like your student was like straight A student coming to class every day, and all of a sudden you notice a drastic change. So you're like, what happened, right? These are how we're finding out more and more of these disclosures. Again, it's not necessarily the law and order like SVU of like, I'm going to call the police and do all these things. A lot of times it's, it's those informal relationships that really allow us to get more and more disclosures. And so we're talking a little bit about rape culture, right? So why is that? Like, why, what are some of the barriers that are folks um, experiencing? And so, like I said, this is a great sign from uh, a protest talking about rape culture. And so oftentimes we tell people folks don't get raped instead of telling folks not to rape, right? It seems something really like clear, like clearly we don't want anybody to like sexually assault anyone else, but you'd be surprised how little we actually have these conversations about not sexually assaulting folks. And what does consent mean? What does healthy like relationships look like, right? We don't often have these conversations, and this is what creates these barriers. If we think about how a lack of consent has really been normalized in our culture, think about almost every sort of like teen, early college show, they're like both reality shows and scripted shows, there's always like at least one line of, oh, somebody gets really drunk and like has sex with someone and wakes up and they don't remember any of it. And it's sort of like, oh, ha ha, like whether or not the person was attractive or not. So that's part of sexual violence, right? Like the idea that we normalize the lack of consent. I listen to a lot of 90s R&B, right? So that's what I listen to primarily. And I was driving down the street and one day, so when you're doing this work, like, it permeates every aspect of your, of your life. Like, there's no longer, I can't really watch TV in the same way. So I'm listening to this song by this group, High Five, and it's called She's Playing Hard to Get. And I'm like driving down the street, singing along, and I was like, wait, this isn't very clear consent. And so they talk about things like, I can tell by the look in her eyes that she really wants me. Then she talks about, you know, you don't have to say a word, right? I can already tell just by your body language. You see a lot of this even really put out there by a lot of like these magazines, like men's magazines and women's magazines. I think there was an article in Cosmo like not too long ago that if, um, according to them, if a man adjusts his socks, then that means that he wants to have sex with you. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like adjusting your sock, right? And so we, like, these magazines make so much money telling people how you can infer consent without actually getting it. We really normalize that consent doesn't need to be explicit, that we don't need this enthusiastic consent, right? 
And so when we're talking about enthusiastic consent, it's not saying, oh, it's an urban. Like, yes, that sounds like a great idea, right? That's enthusiastic consent. Um, thinking about, you know, from songs like Baby It's Cold Outside, right? Every Christmas I hear the song, right? And so thinking about it, she's like, I really should go. And he's like, come on, it's cold, stay. And the one part, like, what's in that drink? What? Right? Like, like thinking about how we so often normalize a lack of consent. Um, everybody knows the picture of the soldier kissing the nurse coming back from um, war. Who knows the real story behind that? They were strangers. And he actually, they both were partnered, right? His girlfriend is, if you look at the picture, his girlfriend is actually right behind him. He was drunk. And if you really pay close attention to the body language, he's pinning her arm, right? And so they interviewed later. There's actually the book called, like, The Kiss. And the woman said, like, I didn't know him. I didn't want to be kissed. He was drunk and showing off, and he just came over, threw her, like, threw her over and kissed her. And we really sort of normally, like, there's a huge statue of it where I think it's in Florida, in San Diego. Like, how often, like, we really normalize, like, this is romance. But we normalize like this lack of consent and sexual violence so often in our society. And so thinking about all these are all the barriers that everybody has to contend against just to report, right? Thinking back to those myths. So if your perpetrator didn't look like, you know, who everybody says perpetrators were. Thinking about how often folks say, oh, well, they're such a great person. They would never do that. Thinking about how we never really recognize men as survivors of sexual violence, right? And so, like, what space does a man have to come and say, like, listen, this is what happened to me, right? All those, all these barriers, thinking about all these different things that we see and hear on a daily basis, um, thinking about whenever there's, like, a high-profile, like, sexual assault case, all the nasty comments are said. Survivors are listening, right? They hear that. And so when they're sexually assaulted, if you're like, oh, well, you know, she was probably lying to get some money or da-da-da, or, oh, come on, guys can't get sexually assaulted, Thinking about the huge interview that just happened with um, Barbara Walters with Mary Kay Letourneau, right? So does everybody remember the Mary Kay Letourneau case? 30 year old, she was 31 years old, a teacher, and she sexually assaulted her 12 year old student. And she got pregnant by him. And um, then she was arrested. Yeah. Yeah, they're married with two kids now. So she got pregnant the first time, was locked up for about like six months, maybe not too long. She gets out, sexually assaults him again, right? Gets pregnant again, um, and then spent like about seven to 10 years in um, prison. She got out, then they got married, right? And so every time, so when this interview was going on, it was about two to three weeks ago, everybody talks about their affair, their relationship. He was 12 years old, and she was 31, 30, 31. Right? Like, that's not an affair. That's an assault. But how often, and I remember um, when that case was going on, hearing on the radio, oh, man, like, a particularly a lot of, like, the male DJs, I wish my teacher looked like that. that. Oh, yeah, like, that would be great. Why couldn't that happen to me? Right? Thinking about, like, how we really normalize uh, sexual violence is not something wrong. So if a young man is assaulted, where's the space to report that? But he also, he also claimed that he loved her because he was only 12. Yeah. You know, but that was why it probably wasn't looked upon as, as assault as much because, you know, it was her doing the, you know, it was her doing it. It wasn't him. He was the recipient. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was bragging to his friends about it. And so it, it was kind of different. It, it was, but it wasn't. Like, you think about, he later on sued um, the school board. If it was a male teacher on a female, there would be no problem. It would be, it would be, I think, like, honestly, it, we see this a lot. Whenever a female teacher is arrested for sexually assaulting a student, the headlines are always teacher has sexual relationship with student consistently, right? Because we don't often view women as per, like potential perpetrators, right? But it's true. And so oftentimes when we think about 12 years old, like 12 years old, there was a lot of things that I loved at 12 years old that I thought I wanted, right? And so there's a reason why we have these consent laws, is that we recognize that children can't make these decisions. And so what I find it most interesting is that he ended up suing the school district, like you should have, um, you should have um, protected me from her, right? He talks also, he talks also about, a lot about throughout the years about why he developed this um, substance abuse problem, right? Dealing with depression. He also talked about how that followed him, like he couldn't get a job, because it, not too long afterwards his face was out there. And everybody like knew how, who he was, and so everybody was like, oh yeah, you was a teacher. And so what sort of space, he really talks about how that case really followed him. 
So what sort of space did he have to sort of build his own life outside of that? And again, like so often, like it just made me so angry that she was really portrayed as like them having an affair. There was a Lifetime movie, and they really made it seem like a seduction. He was 12 years old, right? Mentioned that the age of consent in Connecticut is 16. Yeah. Again, I'm like 16. I, I know, but I'm just <laughs> Yeah. But like thinking about, like, again, how all the decisions that we make as children, right? And so even when we're thinking about child sexual assault, a big sort of myth is like that children can seduce adults, right? And this is absolutely ridiculous. She actually got to know him when he was in second grade. Yeah. I mean, she had known him for quite a while. Yeah, like thinking, like, think about like how, like, horrendous that was, but now they had an affair, they're in love, 10 years married, right? And everything that glitters in gold, <laughs> I would say. In terms of, but like thinking about how often we portray sexual violence as normal, as acceptable, particularly based on who, who the victims are, right? Um, is really, really problematic. And so what is it like, so what are some of the effects of uh, sexual violence, right? And so we know, and I pulled some of this information from uh, Dr. David Lee Beck. And so we know that during an assault, one, most, a lot of times survivors experience disassociation, right? So they're physically there, but their brain, their body's like, what's going on in the present? It's too much for you to handle. And so their brain sort of, they check out. They go somewhere else. Most, but not all, survivors absolutely believe that they are going to die in the moment of an assault. And so thinking about what does that feel like, right? feeling like that you, your life actually may end in the moment, um, and the added trauma of that. Um, a lot of survivors experience tonic immobility. So if you think about playing possum, right, is that like acting like you're asleep, but there's actually no conscious like playing in that. Like your body literally like doesn't allow you to move, scream, do anything like that, really sort of shuts down. Um, and then also experiencing tunnel vision, right? And so a story I always tell, like it's a, we're thinking about trauma. Oftentimes when we think about trauma, we're really comfortable talking about PTSD with the military and police officers, right? We recognize that that can be really rough. But we, there's, I read a study not too long ago where they're like, you're more likely to actually experience PTSD after a sexual assault than even in the military. And so there was this one cop in Chicago, Dr. David Lee Fick, I sort of talked about, and I love this story, sort of illustrates sort of the immediate and after effects of a trauma. He got a call that some guy like robbed like a liquor store or something. They're like, he's in this building in this apartment. Him and his partner go, knock on the door, hey, it's police. The door opens and a gunshot goes off, right? The guy shoots his partner. And so then the cop drags his partner down a hallway and sort of like around like a little ledge. He goes to turn around and pull his gun and then realize that he's just looking at his finger. He had dropped his gun at some point during the like run down the hallway. And so he's down, he's like around, and then he realizes he dropped the gun. So he pulls out his partner's gun, turns, and he sees other police officers. And his training kicks in. He's like, okay, don't shoot. But I need to let them know that was hap what's happening. He couldn't think about any way to let them know what was happening. He had a radio on him the entire time. But in that moment, he was experiencing that trauma. One, immediately after, they asked him to identify the shooter. He couldn't do it. All he remembers was the barrel of the gun. That's that tunnel vision, right? All his like sort of focus was just on that barrel of the gun. They also asked him, how long was that run? The, how long was the hallway? And he was like, 200 to 300 feet, easily. It was only about 25 feet, right? And then later they let him hear the, um, the recording of all, everybody talking to him, trying to get his attention, and he wasn't able to hear any of that. His experiences are very similar to a lot of survivors during an assault. But we have this assumption because of the law and order and a lot of different things that after an assault, survivors are able to string together a linear sort of streamline of events. They can get very clear concise descriptions of what happened. And that's just not true. Trauma really disrupts a lot of different chemicals in the brain. And so folks really aren't able to get a lot of that information. And so thinking about sort of our um, assumptions of what trauma looks like. And then even when we're talking about like the tonic immobility, that freezing. That also adds on to the trauma later, because people are like, well, why didn't you yell? Why didn't you scream? And survivors are asking themselves the same thing, when they absolutely physically could not have done any of that in the moment. And more people fall into that than we realize. And so we go from that, so what, are the, so what is going on immediately after? One, confusion. What just happened to me? Was it actually a rape, right? 
um, thinking back to Jeffrey Marsalis again, like you went out on this date, you were having a relatively good time, and the next thing you remember, you're waking up in the bed. And he's like, I had a great time, see you tomorrow. Like, let's do this again. And so in your mind, you're like, what just happened? Right, even if it was very clear what just happened, like this couldn't have happened to me, is really common. Self-blame, and so we sort of talked about what, like, what does self-blame actually do for survivors, right? I always tell people don't like immediately just be like, no, it wasn't your fault. Like, let hold space for them, listen to them, and like recognize that in that moment, that self-blame is doing something for them. It's being, it's a, a part of the healing process. You don't want to stay there, but it recognize it serves a purpose. Experiencing denial, numbness, hysteria, or both, right? And so going from uh, thinking, um, particularly when I would do hospital accompaniments, is that I would say. About like 60% of the time when I went in, like folks were at, like really like visibly crying and upset, but other times they weren't, right? Sometimes I was able to have like sort of quote unquote like regular conversations. Our assumption about what trauma looks like really differs depending on the per person. The first weeks and months, a lot of survivors will experience a lot of oscillation in their feelings, right? So they're happy, they're sad, they're angry, they're crying. And like that also makes them feel like they're not in control of their own emotions. Um, irritability, anger, social withdrawal, sexual dysfunction, and increased um, substance abuse. Uh, particularly for thinking about um, as professors and folks working with students, like that social withdrawal, the irritability and anger, that's what you may be able to pick up on immediately, right? You're like, you know, they're, they're acting a little bit differently. And we know some long-term effects are poor school and job performance, uh, limited problem-solving skills, belief in rigid gender roles, substance use, increased use and tolerance for violence, re-victimization. And I want to talk a little bit about the re-victimization. So we know that if you were sexually assaulted as a child, you're about three to seven times more likely to be sexually assaulted again. Most often people, I've heard this too many times, and I don't, there's no really like conclusive evidence of why that is, but this is just sort of the, stati the statistic that we have. Some people like to say, well, oh, you're missing those cues that somebody is dangerous, right? But again, like perpetrators of sexual violence don't walk around with these signs saying, like, listen, I'm going to sexually assault you. Well, we do know that some of the long-term effects, particularly like substance abuse, makes folks more vulnerable to experience um, sexual violence. We know particularly, um, I saw one statistic that if you are homeless, have a mental illness and were uh, a victim of child sexual assault, you're almost 100% likely to experience sexual violence again. And so thinking about what are some of the long-term effects, um, particularly mental health issues that don't go like helped or checked or aren't treated, right? Um, those make folks more vulnerable. So this isn't the blanket case across the board. There is no conclusive evidence, but I don't, I don't think, and I haven't seen or read anything that really proves that people are missing these um, cues that someone is violent. And so when we're thinking about the trauma of sexual violence, it's important to recognize that the trauma doesn't, like I said earlier, it doesn't disrupt only like one part of your life. It really changes every aspect of your um, life. A lot of times when I was working with survivors, they were like, I just want to go back to the way I was before. I just want to go back to the person that I was before. And that's just not possible, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to Experiencing a tra traumatic event, particularly sexual violence, changes you. It doesn't have to be for the worse. It doesn't mean you're going to be a worse person, but like you've experienced something significant, and you're going to have to adjust to that. Um, and it really, like, it's a, it really changes a lot of things. And I think a lot of folks aren't necessarily always aware of that. Shouldn't have used white because it's not showing up too well. But so when we're thinking about some of the effects of trauma, one is that it destroys two essential beliefs. One, a sense of trust, and a sense of control over um, our lives. And so thinking about it, particularly if you're sexually assaulted by someone you know and someone you trust, immediately a lot of survivors are like, then what can, can I trust my instincts about people? Can I trust that this is a safe place and this isn't a safe place? When someone that you trust, and not only you trust, but a lot of other people trust, violates that, then what do you do? Where do you go from there? And also the sense of control over someone's, over your own life is really, um, really important, right? And so when we're working, particularly when we're working with survivors and our advocates, what we really like to stress is that we work on the empowerment model. Ultimately, they know what's best for them. They know their lives better than we do. And we want them to feel as in, more, as in most control of their lives as they possibly can be. Um, and again, trauma is also an experience of like the, 
the level of tra trauma that you experience or how it affects your life really depends on your support system, what other stressors that you're experiencing. This is a great picture from, there's this uh, website called Project Unbreakable, and it's a lot of survivors holding up signs about things that maybe their perpetrator said, maybe messages um, to their perpetrator, or how they feel about their sexual assault. It can be very triggering, but also very empowering um, if anybody wants to check it out. But like the sign says, you make me think, but I will not drown, right? Um, so trauma can look like a lot of different things. One, a lack of grounding, terror, worthlessness, feeling of being unsafe, hopelessness, despair, rage, guilt, distress, and feeling of isolation, right? And so a lot of survivors can experience all of these, none of these, or some of these, right? Trauma really looks different for each individual, but it's important to recognize um, that these are some of the things that they may be feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. Particularly the feeling of isolation, we see real, a lot, right? Again, so often uh, folks who are sexually assaulted feel like they're all alone. And oftentimes this is reinforced by other people. They're like, what are you talking about? Well, that's not, that would never happen to me, or different things like that. Really reinforces this feeling of isolation. And so one of the things that's really important, why we have a lot of these big public awareness events and things like that, is to allow folks to know that they're not alone, that it didn't only happen to them, right? Um, I always think about in terms of feeling uh, like worthlessness and feeling of being unsafe, right? That could oftentimes lead to hypervigilance, like always being on guard, looking for the next, next assault around the corner. I worked with one woman who was sexually assaulted when there was construction going around. And she wasn't, she was only sort of vaguely like aware of the construction going on. But like later she walked by an area and there was construction going on and she was triggered, right? She was sent into flashbacks and she felt like she was being assaulted again. Like this is what, um, like this is what happens to a lot of folks. Small things that they may not be like very consciously aware of in the moment will trigger like the, the feelings and remembering of the assault. Whether it be sounds, smells, textures, different things, right? And also we, when we're thinking about feeling of like worthlessness, I always think about this one woman I worked with. Um, she literally only came in once. She sort of like was brought in by a friend. And I've never met someone who has such sort of like, not low self-esteem, but like no self-esteem. And she's been someone who at 50 years old had been sexually assaulted by um, her stepfather from a young age. And at 50 years old, it was still happening, right? And so for years, like she just absolutely thought that was like, like that just was part of who she was, right? And I was like, listen, it doesn't happen, you know, this is wrong, what happened to you isn't okay. And she goes, I just sort of feel like this is what I was meant, uh, why I was put here, right? And so we're thinking about like the long-term effects of sexual violence, particularly without any like support or treatment and folks just reinforcing that it was sort of your fault it can really have a, like a long lasting like damaging effect over folks lives. And so it's important like support is so important. Not everybody needs nor wants to be into therapy, but having someone that they can depend on, someone that can hold like that space for them, that healing space for them is really important. And so when we're thinking about sexual violence and oppression. So I love Audrey Lord. Has anybody heard of Audrey Lord? Okay. Like, I love her. I even have a tattoo of one of her quotes. Like, big fan of Audrey Lord, right? And so she has this quote that I absolutely love. And that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, right? And I love that. Like, I can't, I tell people all the time, like, we can't end sexual violence without ending any, any, every other form of oppression, right? We can't end sexual violence and think we're only going to focus on that and, like, ignore everything else. And thankfully, context agrees as well, right? These are things that are important to us. But it's important to know that sexual violence um, really permeates like, across a lot of different forms of oppression. And also it's important to remember that a lot of people have multi-layered identities, right? Nobody has just sort of single identities, right? And so I use myself as an example. Like I'm black, clearly I'm a woman. I'm cisgender woman. I'm also queer, right? And so these are all important parts of my identity. I don't get to choose like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be black. The day after the next I'm going to be a woman. You know, three days after that, I'm going to be like queer. Like, that, that's, that's not how it works for me, right? And that's not how it works for anyone. All parts of my identity carry with me on a day-to-day -day basis. And similarly, when I experience oppression, all of those parts of my identity are similarly, like, grouped together. 
and also sort of my experiences, like everything comes with me. When I walk into a room, I bring all my 31 years with me. And so thinking similarly when you're working with students, they're bringing all of themselves with them, all of their identities, all of their histories, all their experiences with systems are all coming with them. It's also important to recognize that we live in an oppressive society, right? Like all these different forms of oppression like happen on a daily basis. And so students aren't going to be able to sort of separate those apart. And that also impacts like whether or not they're going to be able to, uh, the, the willingness they are to like engage with systems. If I have had like negative interactions with uh, law enforcement, with medical staff, I'm going to be a, less, a lot less likely to ever like see one of those places as a place that I can trust. If, uh, there's one study that was done that said like one negative experience like with like a nurse or some other like healthcare professional will make folks less likely to ever see any other healthcare uh, professionals. So we're talking about dentists, OBGYNs, like general practitioners. Thinking about how one like negative experience really impacts others. Um, and so it's important to think about oftentimes, particularly when I'm talking about like folks from oppressed communities, like I get sort of like two reactions, right? And so some one part people are like, listen, I don't see any of that. I just treat people like people. And that's great, right? But you need to recognize all parts of everyone's identities. Because if you're not seeing all my identities, you're not really seeing me. And it's also important, folks are it's also important for folks to be aware of the barriers that folks that people may experience. And so it's not saying that if I'm coming to you for support, you're like, listen, I know you experienced all this oppression based on X, Y, and Z, um, and I'm going to help you with that and like really name it. But it's about, about you being aware of potential barriers that they may be facing, right? And so the other sort of reaction that I often get is like, people are like, okay, well, then t give me the language to talk to them. Like, um, I would say sort of like people treating me like aliens. Like, tell me how to speak to your people. And I'm like, that's not like how, like the insurance question, like that's not how this works, that's not how any of this works, right? And so ultimately, like survivors need support from everyone, but that doesn't mean that you can ignore their identities or the potential barriers that they may face, right? And so that means you need to be listening to them. Like listening is the biggest act of solidarity that you can do. Listening to them in the history and when they're feeling hesitant or nervous about pieces, that's really important. And so, I found this new video that I love. I'm trying to work into every single presentation, but it sort of works, right? And so part of that is understanding power and privilege. Understanding what power that you hold and what privilege you hold and how that affects the way that you see the world versus how it affects the person you're working with that's going to see the world. And even if you have very similar um, interactions. And so this is a great video, and then we'll talk a little bit about it in a second. In the garden, there's a caterpillar and a snail, and they're basically best friends. They hang out 24-7, they do dinner, movie nights, crafts, um, they're like really into cosplay on top of like whatever else caterpillars and snails do, like eat leaves or something. Anyways, one day they're on their way to a party that's right outside the garden, and they have to go through the fence to get there. So the caterpillar goes right through, but the snail is stuck. Michelle is just too big and it won't fit into the wire. So she's like, crap, I can't get through. Maybe like, can you lift up the wire or maybe we can build a little bridge or something? And the caterpillar's like, dude, just go under. But she can't. There's just no way that the shell is gonna fit. And the caterpillar's like, go under, come on. We're gonna be late and I'm trying to hook up with that super cute ladybug. But it's not happening. The shell will not fit under the wire. And at this point, Snail's getting kind of frustrated because it's not like she doesn't want to go to the party. But for some reason, Caterpillar just isn't getting it. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy for me. I just can't crawl under the fence like you can. So I would really appreciate your help here. Maybe we can like go a different way. Or the, And this just like sets the Caterpillar off. What the heck? Just because I can crawl under stuff doesn't mean that I have it easy. Do you even know what it's like to have 16 feet? You don't, because finding shoes is a complete nightmare. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not saying you have it easy. I'm just saying I can't go under the fence because of my shell. That's it. I have a shell and you don't. And there's some stuff that's easier for you that's harder for me. Just like I don't know jack about finding shoes because I don't have feet. Caterpillar thinks about this for a second and realizes the snail is right. I mean, he's never had to think about shells or slimy trails, and that's a privilege that the snail has never had because she has to think about that stuff all the time. That's part of being a snail. 
and it's kind of like that for everyone, right? I mean, we all have our own struggles and challenges, and some of them are small, and some of them are huge and really unfair and beyond our control. And a lot of the time, it can be hard to see what someone else deals with because you've never been in their shoes or shell. I mean, like maybe you're gay or trans, have a disability or a different religion, or of course the obvious one, you're a member of a different race. I don't know what it's like to be you, and you don't know what it's like to be me. So it's really important to stop and try and see the other side so we can help each other overcome those obstacles together. It's like sometimes you're the snail and sometimes you're the caterpillar. Oh yeah, okay, so then the snail and the caterpillar figured out that if they went to the other side of the garden, they could get through a little break in the fence. And while it took a little longer to get to the party, they did the trip together, which is what made it so great. So they got to the party, the caterpillar hooked up with the ladybugs, snail taught everyone how to do the wobble, and the party was everything. The end. Alright. So again, I love that sometimes you're a snail, sometimes you're a caterpillar. Right? And so it's really important. I like that it, the way it frames talking about like power and privilege and experiences. So often we think like a lot of this is sort of like understand it, like under like not stated, right? We just sort of really disregard it, like, oh well, everybody can do X, Y, or Z. And so it's important to always sort of really pay attention to the potential barriers that folks are facing. And also like if you are a survivor working with a survivor. Doesn't mean that like, and their assault looks very similar to what yours did. Doesn't mean that everything that you were able to do that they have access to. Doesn't mean that what, how you felt they similarly feel as well. It's really important to pay attention to power and privilege. And also your power as being like a, a staff member, faculty member of this um, university, right? Thinking about like that carries power. Like how may that be intimidating to folks as well? If they feel like there are any possible like repercussions that can happen to them. Paying attention to power and privilege is the one of the best ways that you can support survivors. So we're going to take like a 10 minute break and then we'll come back.